Hi, everybody, and welcome back to What on Earth Am I Here For? Now, in our last session, we looked at God's first purpose for your life, and that is you were planned for God's pleasure. Nothing brings more pleasure to God than for you to know him and to love him. That's what worship is all about, loving God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. Now, in this session, we're going to look at God's second purpose for your life, and it is this. You were formed for God's family. We call this the purpose of fellowship. God doesn't want you to just know and love him. He also wants you to know and love his family. The Bible says that family is the church of the living God. Now, the church is not a building, and the church is not an institution, and the church is not an organization, and the church is not a club. The church is not a place you go to, and the church is not an event. The church is a family. It's a family you belong to. It is the spiritual family of God. Now, this is really important to understand. Contrary to popular opinion, we are not all God's children. Now, we're all created by God. We're all loved by God, but we're not all his children. The Bible tells us the only way to become a child of God is by placing your faith in Jesus Christ. The Bible says it like this. God's unchanging plan has always been to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. In other words, I'm not automatically in the family. I'm brought into his family through Jesus Christ. The Bible also says, but to all those who received Jesus Christ, to them, that is those who trust in his name, he has given the privilege of becoming children of God. That's John chapter 1, verse 12. So it is only through Jesus Christ that we actually become God's children. As God's children, as members of his family, we all have family responsibilities. And the number one responsibility in the family of God is this. You have to learn to love everybody else in God's family. Jesus said this, I am giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. In other words, you're in my family. Now, I don't want you to miss this. The number one reason Jesus wants us to love each other is not so that we'll be happy. It's not so that we can have our own little private club. The number one reason Jesus wants us to love each other in the family of God is so that the world will see our love and will want to become a part of God's family too. God wants us to love each other because other people's eternal destinies are at stake. You see, life is all about learning how to love, learning how to love each other, and the church is the laboratory where we learn how to love, where we learn how to love each other. This is what the purpose of fellowship is all about. Now, there are four levels of fellowship, four levels of learning to love each other, and each of these levels shows you how to have a deeper, more intimate, more satisfying, and more fulfilling relationships. What you learn in your church family, you will use everywhere else in your life because life is all about learning how to love. Now, the first level of fellowship is what I call the fellowship of sharing together the fellowship of sharing together. All love starts with sharing. You share conversations, you share meals, you share ideas. And the more you share with somebody, the more you grow to love them. If you don't ever share with them, you're not gonna learn to love them. But the more time you spend sharing with somebody, the closer you're going to get to them. The first followers of Jesus Christ were famous for being loving people. And why were they such loving people? Well, the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 2. All the believers met together constantly, circle that, constantly, and shared everything with each other. There's that word share, circle that word, shared everything. Now, the reason why they're famous for their love is that they spent time together and they shared everything together. You can't build a relationship without spending time together. It's true in your small group, it's true in your church, it's true in your family. True fellowship takes time. Just like a great marriage takes time, a great friendship takes time, you build deep relationships with people by spending time together. It doesn't happen by accident. Now, luck has nothing to do with it. It's all about choosing 
choosing to share time and choosing to share your life with somebody else. If you don't have any close friendships, it's because you aren't taking any time to spend with other people. Now, this is why small groups are so important. And I hope your small group will continue even after we finish this 40 days together. Because this is where true fellowship happens, in a small group, not in a crowd. The Bible says, let us not give up the habit of meeting together. Notice, it's a habit. What is a habit? A habit is something you do over and over and over. You do it all the time. Let us not give up the habit of meeting together. Instead, let us encourage one another. You need to make fellowship a habit. And this is not a habit that was invented in the 21st century. The church has been doing it for 2,000 years. Don't ever stop meeting together in a small group. In fact, did you know that for the first 300 years of Christianity, there were no church buildings? Everybody met in homes. And that's why we have small groups in homes. That's how they did it in the Bible. The Bible says in 1 Peter 4, 9, open your homes to each other without complaining. Now that's a command of God. Why? Because when you let people into your home, you let people into your life. And you can't learn to love people if you're always shutting them out of your life and out of your home. Small group life is the first level of love. It's learning the fellowship of sharing. Now, what am I supposed to share? Well, in your small group, I want you to learn to share two things. First, you share your experiences. What's going on in your life? What happened to you this week? both the good things and the bad things. The Bible says that's good. That's part of fellowship. You are to share what you know, the experiences of your life. What has God been teaching you? Now, the Bible gives us some instructions about what to do in a small group. It says this, when you gather, each one of you, in other words, not just one person do all the talking, each one of you be prepared with something that will be useful for all. Sing a hymn, teach a lesson, tell a story, lead in a prayer, provide an insight, uh, bring some dessert. By the way, I just threw that one in. (laughs) Take your turn with no one person taking over, and you'll all learn from each other. I love that, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. So, in your small group, you share your experiences, and you share what you learn from each other and with each other. Now, the other thing you share in a small group is you share your support. You support each other. The Bible says, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Now, the cool thing about that verse is that when you share your joy, your joy is doubled because somebody else becomes joyful too. But when you share your sorrow, your sorrow is cut in half because somebody else is now carrying your burden with you. That's why this first level of fellowship is learning to share. Sharing is where love begins. But that's not all there is to fellowship. You've got to go on to the second level of fellowship. This is a deeper level. And that is called the fellowship of belonging together. First sharing together, the second level is belonging together. For love to grow deep, you have to grow beyond sharing. Because love is a commitment The Greek word in the Bible for fellowship is the word koinonia. And what koinonia really means is being as committed to each other as we are to Jesus Christ. Wow, that's real fellowship. That's what belonging is all about. Being committed to each other as we are to Jesus Christ. That's the fellowship of belonging. Now, belonging is the difference between mm, dating and getting married. Belonging is the difference between casual attendance at church and being a member of a church. Belonging is the difference between being a a spectator at church and being a participator at church. Belonging is the difference between being an outsider watching things happen and being an insider helping to make things happen. That's belonging, and that's God's second goal for your life. The Bible says that God wants every one of us to belong to a church family. It says this, you are members of God's very own family and you belong, circle that, you belong in God's household with every other Christian. We're not just believers, we're belongers. The Bible says a follower of Jesus without a church family is an orphan. And without a church, you don't have a spiritual home. 
You don't have any roots. You're not going to get the strength and the support and the spiritual nourishment you need to survive. Let me be as clear as I possibly can, can be. You cannot fulfill God's five purposes for your life without other people in your life, and that's called the church. The Bible says this in Romans 12, in Christ, we who are many form one body and each member belongs, there's that word again, belongs to all the others. Circle that word belong. If you're in God's family, you belong to every other believer. Did you get that? See, belonging is not optional. The Bible says the person who loves God must also love other believers. That's a command. It's the second purpose of your life, learning how to love the family of God. The Bible says, love your spiritual family. And you're, you show your love for people by taking the step of commitment to become a member of your church, to become not just a believer, but a belonger. Now, there's an even deeper level of fellowship. That's the third level of fellowship, and we call that the fellowship of serving together. First we share together, then we belong together, then we move to the third level of intimacy, which is the fellowship of serving together. Now, if you want to deepen the love in your marriage, and if you want to deepen the love in a friendship, and if you want to deepen the love in your small group, here's the secret. Start serving God together. This is the level where you join forces, you pool your resources, you partner for a common purpose. And when you partner with somebody in a common purpose, guess what? Your love grows deeper for that person, and their love grows deeper for you. And when a small group works together to serve a common purpose, it takes that group to a whole deeper level. You know, it is amazing to see the brotherhood uh, that combat veterans have together. Guys who serve maybe just a year or two, or maybe three years at the most together. And then 20, 30 years or 40 years or longer later, they're still keeping in contact with each other. What is it that causes veterans to stay in touch with other vets? Because there's a level of love and a level of fellowship and a level of partnership that comes when you're serving together on a common task that you cannot get anywhere else. It comes at this third level of fellowship, serving together for a common purpose. You see, God never meant for you to serve him alone. Let me say that again. God never meant for you to serve God alone. The Bible says we are partners working together for God. 1 Corinthians 3, 9. When you serve together with some other Christians, it draws you closer to the people you're partnering with, and there are great advantages to partnering in service. For one thing, you get more done. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 4, two people are better than one because they get more done by working together. Now, you know, those of you who enjoy sports know that there was a very famous article in the New York Times a few years ago, and the title was called, You Don't Need Superstars to Win. And what they did is they did a study of winning sports teams, and they found that having a superstar actually on your team wasn't enough. In other words, the teams that really keep competing year after year and keep winning year after year in their area of expertise are not those who are the biggest superstars or the highest paid players. It's the teams who know how to work together. A team that knows how to be a team. A team of normal people working together will always outlast the team that is a superstar but doesn't work together. That is the power of fellowship. And it's the reward of fellowship in serving together, it takes you to a deeper level of love that you can't find any other way. Saddleback Church, the church I pastor, is a great, great church. And the reason it's a great and effective church is because it was built on people who are team players. Not on people who are always out for the glory themselves, but people say, let's, let's do this together. You know, God can do great things through people who don't care who gets the credit. Not only do you get more done, but you actually grow personally when you are serving with others. The Bible says the whole body, it's talking about the church, is fitted together perfectly. And as each part, each of us have a part, does its own special work, 
It helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Now there's one more level of fellowship, the fourth level, and this one is the deepest of all. Sharing together and serving together, belonging together, but the fourth level is called the fellowship of suffering together. Suffering together. And this is the deepest, most intimate form of love. Love grows deepest when we suffer together. As I said, this is the deepest level of fellowship. When you share a pain, when you share a hurt, when you share a heartache, when you enter in and walk alongside somebody else who's going through a tough time, when you go through suffering like that, it's going to draw you closer to people who walk through it with you and when you walk through it with them. There is nothing like the fellowship of suffering. The amazing thing about suffering is that it is humanizing. It makes us more human. It's also unifying. It brings us closer together. When, have you ever watched a, a community after a disaster? People who've been fighting and bickering and debating all come together after a disaster. Suffering draws us together in spite of our differences. Galatians 6.2 says it like this. Share each other's troubles and problems. And in this way, you obey the law of Christ. What is the law of Christ? Well, it is love your neighbor as yourself. That's the law of Christ. And when you serve together, you do your part. But when you suffer together, you share your heart. Do you ever do that with anybody? Let me ask you that again. Do you ever have that level of suffering and fellowship with anybody? Do you ever take any time in your life to help somebody who's in pain? Or are you too busy? If you're never taking time to help anybody in pain, let me just say this, you're too busy. You're missing one of the major purposes of your life because the bottom line is it's all about relationships. Life is a laboratory of learning how to love and God intentionally puts people in your life in pain so you get the opportunity to love them. Now I want you to listen very closely. Relationships are more important than accomplishments. Relationships are more important than achievements. Relationships are more important than success. Relationships are more important than money. Why? Because life is all about learning how to love. The second purpose of life, fellowship. If you don't learn how to love God, worship, and you don't learn how to love other people, fellowship, your life is wasted in God's eyes. Now, this is what it means to be a part of a church family. It, we're not talking about attending a service. We're talking about being a part of Christ's body, belonging, serving, loving, sharing, suffering together. The Bible says if one member suffers, all suffer together. Now, I don't know if you've noticed it, but uh, if you got a toothache, <laughs> your whole body hurts. When one part of the body of Christ hurts, we should all hurt with it. The Bible says be devoted to each other like a loving family. That means you're to treat every other Christian woman as a sister, and you are to treat every other Christian man as a brother, because you are in the same family, the family of God, and that family is gonna last forever. You know, everybody knows John 3.16, God so loved the world, but most people don't know 1 John 3.16, and that's in the Bible too. And it's just as important. 1 John 3.16 says this, we know what real love is because Christ gave his love for us, his life for us. That's John 3.16. But it says, we ought to give up our lives for our Christian brothers and sisters. That's the meaning of real fellowship, koinonia, being as committed to each other as we are to Jesus Christ, giving our lives for each other. You know, at Saddleback Church, we don't want our church to be known for its size or its songs or its sermons or its pastors or the, the buildings or anything else. We want our church family to be known for its love. We want people to go, that's the place where they love each other. And if you want to know why Saddleback Church has grown from just two people, my wife and I, to over 20,000 people, it's because Saddleback is a church where the love of Christ is practiced in a daily, visible manner. 
When you have a church where people love each other like this, they experience the fellowship of sharing, the fellowship of belonging, the fellowship of serving, and the fellowship of suffering together. When you have a church like that, you'd have to lock the doors to keep people out. Because I want you to know, friends, people are looking for love in all the wrong places. And if you and your small group and your church loves, you will have more people than you could possibly imagine. Love always attracts. I want us to close in prayer. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, next to salvation, the greatest gift you've given us is the opportunity to be a part of your family. Forgive us for taking it for granted. Thank you that we don't have to go through life disconnected and isolated. Now I want you to pray. As our heads are bowed, in your heart, just say something like this. Dear God, just say this in your mind. Dear God, I want to learn to love. And I want to especially learn how to love my spiritual family, just like you do. And dear God, I want to grow in these four levels of fellowship. I want to learn the fellowship of sharing together. I want to grow in the fellowship of belonging together. I want to practice the fellowship of serving together. And I want to experience the fellowship of suffering together. So today, I'm making a choice. I'm choosing to belong to a small group and to a church family. I'm not going to float around anymore. I'm going to be a belonger, not just a believer. And I want to do my part in the family of God that you lead me to. And I want to learn to love each other in my family as brothers and sisters. Teach me the meaning of real love. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, God bless you, and may God uh, uh, give you a great discussion time together. I'll see you in our next session.